Hello everyone, my name is Antonio Reynoso and I am the president of the greatest borough in the world, Brooklyn. One of the most important responsibilities I have as borough president is overseeing Brooklyn's 18 community boards. But what exactly is a community board? What hidden power do they hold? And why should you get involved? Over the next 30 minutes, I'm going to answer all of these questions and more, inviting special guests to help me paint the picture of the most grassroots level of our local government. Pay close attention because now through February 14th, you yourself can apply to join our community board. First off, what is a community board? Brooklyn is divided into 18 community districts, and each one of these community districts has its own community board made up of 50 people who live, work, or are closely involved with their community. That might mean your church or school is here, your job, or anything else along those lines. These community boards are the grassroots of our local government, and their main job is to weigh in on new proposals and policies with elected officials and city agencies, ensuring the needs of the community are reflected in any changes coming to their neighborhood. Frequently, this means weighing in on land use and planning issues, deciding whether a neighborhood will build more housing, promote industrial activity, or create more public transportation. Beyond zoning, community boards also make recommendations on liquor licenses, city services like sanitation, and our city budget process. What each community board focuses on is largely up to the Brooklynites who comprise it, which is why it's so important to get involved and understand the power community boards hold. Today, community boards are advisory only. They make recommendations but don't have the final word which means many people make the mistake of thinking our community boards don't have any real authority. Community boards, however, have a powerful tool that when used intentionally can significantly alter the future of their neighborhood. It's, a, it's called conditional approval and comes in the form of a yes but. Elected officials and city agencies want community board approval. It shows that they're doing a good job and have the support of the people. So by working with city officials through an approval, community boards can ensure neighborhood needs are incorporated into finalized policies. What do I mean by this? Here's an example. Last year, the city council approved the largest rezoning on the former mayor Bill de Blasio's two-term administration, the Gowanus Neighborhood Plan to upzone 82 blocks of Gowanus and create as many as 8,500 new apartments, including 3,000 affordable homes. The plan was debated for over a decade before it made its way to the finish line, and community boards were a major part of that process. Community Board 6, which oversees the majority of the area in question, approved the rezoning under certain conditions. They said they'd support the project as long as the city funded hundreds of millions in repairs at two NYCHA facilities, initiated a racial impact study of the rezoning, and agreed to a few other conditions. Because of Community Board 6's advocacy and the support of other local leaders, Gowanus Houses and Wyckoff Gardens Houses, two public housing developments, will see about 200 million in renovations. Plus, the rezoning was the first to have an independent racial impact study, showing that it would increase income and racial diversity in the community. So while community boards may have limited formal authority, they are rich in influence. They're working behind the scenes of bike lanes, housing development, traffic, trash, and so much more, amplifying the community's perspective to advance the well-being of their neighbors. But community boards have a long history, and they've changed quite a bit since the first boards were established in Manhattan in 1951, back when they were called community planning councils. Back then, community planning councils were charged with advising the borough president on planning and budgetary matters. It wasn't until Mayor John Lindsay, over a decade later, that community boards began monitoring the delivery of city services too. Community boards hold incredible potential. They can be mighty centers of community power, where local voices are heard and the needs of the people are addressed. But the truth is, 
that over the years, our city has hamstrung them with limited resources and inadequate recru recruitment and diversity, undermining community boards' ability to carry out their charter-mandated responsibilities. It is my job to bring this history with me into present day and find new ways to improve and empower Brooklyn's 18 community boards so they can be the democratic foundation to our city that they were always meant to be. And now, I'd like to invite my director of community boards, Ms. Caroline Church, to discuss the changes to our community boards we've already made one year into my administration and the many more soon to come. I imagine a Brooklyn built for and by the people who call our borough home. And in order to achieve that vision, our community boards need some serious reform. Luckily, my administration knows just the person for the job. Joining us today is Ms. Caroline Church, my director of community boards. Welcome, Caroline. How are you? Thank you, Mr. Borough President. <laughs> I am well. I'm glad. I'm glad. So all these folks want to know, how did you get here? Community boards. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Oh, my. It's a long story that began <laughs> when I was born in Trinidad and Tobago in the years just after independence. Oh, wow. So it was a time when people felt self-empowerment. They mm. felt self-determination. They knew it could happen. Mm. So there was a lot of civic engagement then. Mm. As a child, I would be taken along to the village council meetings where wow. folks were advocating for better roads, better service delivery, mm -hmm. where they were talking about supporting their local arts organizations and sport teams. Mm -hmm. So I brought that sort of energy with me when I came to Brooklyn as a young adult. Wow, so community boards was just right up your alley. It was just right up my <laughs> alley. I started working at the Prospect Park Alliance and had mm -hmm. to engage with the community boards that surrounded the park. Oh. And then I left Prospect Park Alliance and guess where I went to work? At a community board. And then <laughs> I ended up with you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so happy you're with us. Can you tell us some, uh, in your experience, some of the changes you would like to see at community boards or what you think changes that would be positive for the community board are? I think community boards need to be properly funded so that they can do the work that they were meant to do. Right. Community boards are an amazing concept. Bringing democracy to the people, creating a direct channel from the community to government, mm -hmm. wiping away the bureaucracy and actually engaging with the bureaucracy right, right. to make the changes that the community would like to see. Mm -hmm. um, I would also like to see our boards be much more diverse. Okay. And how do, how do we get here with the lack of resources? How, why is it that uh, the community boards don't have the funding that they need to be able to do their job? I think that began back with the Charter Revision of 1989, when the role of boards and the borough president was reimagined. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, the Charter did not clarify the relationship between the community boards, mayoral agencies, mm -hmm. and the borough halls. Mm -hmm. So that has resulted in a sort of ad hoc system of norms and mm -hmm. customs mm -hmm. that sometimes leave community boards in limbo and also leave them struggling for resources such as technical assistance, right. um, even funding, mm -hmm. HR support. Right. Um, so I think that's how we got there. <laughs> Yeah, so I, the charter comes out, it re-envisions re what a borough president is going to be and what they're going to do. Uh, community boards are under the work, the, the guise of the borough president. And then it starts just like the defunding. It almost makes it feel like the charter mandated responsibility of community boards can't be executed because of the lack of resources. Oh, agreed. You know, community boards, all 59 of them, regardless of size of constituency, get about $258,000 per year. So it's just enough to hire three, three and a half staffers and have some funds left over for office supplies. Unfortunately, this means that if a member goes off on leave, their one third of the staff mm -hmm. is down. Um, they're not able to update their technology or their equipment as required so that they can do the work that they were meant to do. Right. Uh, absolutely. So let's, do, let's take a step back. And just for the folks that don't know, like what does a community board do? Community boards, again, I like to say they're a direct link between the citizenry and government. They afford the people a place to meet and discuss with city officials the plans for their district. It might be something as, should we change the, 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 the street uh, direction, traffic mm -hmm. flow? Mm -hmm. uh, 
or traffic lights. It might be more complex, mm -hmm. like putting in bike lanes if we're talking transportation. Mm -hmm. We also have what's called ULERP, the Uniform, uniform Land Use Review Process, yes. in which uh, the disposition of land and city property is, is discussed and mm -hmm. recommendations are made by the people who lived in the community mm -hmm. and whom such projects would affect, whether it's the way they travel, it, it may change the direction of traffic, it may increase traffic, mm -hmm. it may bring more residents, therefore needing more amenities. And who better to give advice on those things than the people who live there? That's awesome. I think uh, a lot of folks in Brooklyn might not know that they can get involved. They might not know uh, how effective their voices can be if they just join the community board. Right? And uh, just to see it be the entry level civic engagement of a neighborhood and all the things that they could uh, affect meaningful change in, I think is absolutely amazing. And I'm so grateful. Uh, to finding you and all your experience that you have uh, in community boards and being able to help us navigate all that. But ultimately the goal here is to get the city agencies to do their job so that the community boards could be even more empowered and more independent. Absolutely, mm -hmm. absolutely. That's awesome. So now, what about policy making? So uh, are there things that come from community boards that, get, that come to, my, to me and my office? Has a community board ever presented something to the borough president that they wanted to see changed uh, in a positive way or in any way in a, in a neighborhood or, or in, their, in their community? Well, community boards under ULIP applications make right. recommendations that come to the borough president. Okay. Um, and, and so they're able to say, Mr. Bar President, you're going to be making a recommendation to the mayor and to the city council, and this is what we would like to see. We would like to see this project shaped this way to bring these benefits to our community. So it's not just about what the agency or the developer mm -hmm. may want, but All it's right. about what will also benefit the community, and they will relay that information to the office, and we will review it. Okay. And then for some people, they might think the community board is full of very powerful people uh, that have all the influence in the community. Can you talk about the makeup of community boards and who represents them and who can be on community boards? Oh, my goodness. Every <laughs> Brooklyn light over the age of 16 can be on a community board. All you desire is a passion to serve your community. On the boards, I think we would like to see every voice represented. As we say for this year's uh, application campaign, your voice matters. Yes, yes. Um, so we're looking for carpenters, bus drivers, letter carriers. We're looking for health professionals, education professionals. We're looking for everyone that lives, works, mm -hmm. or has a significant interest in the community. Do you own property? Do you have a business in this community? You can be on the community board. It requires about six to eight hours of mm -hmm. time per month. That will include meetings and preparing for the meetings because there's a lot of stuff to read. Okay. We also offer workshops and trainings because we want to be sure that our members are equipped to do the work, right? right. You might be an attorney, but it doesn't mean you know land use, yes. right? Right, right? So everyone needs to be given those educational tools. We're also looking for NYCHA, NYCHA residents to join mm -hmm. the boards. Why? Because NYCHA develop housing developments house a lot of people, but mm -hmm. unfortunately, many are not represented at boards. Boards have traditionally tended towards older mm -hmm. homeowners. Yeah. Um, so part of this year's goals is really about getting diversity in age, diversity in culture, diversity in profession, mm -hmm. diversity in abilities, diversity in transportation modes. Do you take access right? <laughs> or do you right. call Uber? Or do you drive your own car? Do you bike mostly? We want to hear your voice on the community board. That's awesome. Well, thank you so much, Caroline, uh, for helping us reform our community boards, which have been a top priority for our administration. So I'm really excited for all of the improvements 2023 will bring. And I expect our community boards will be having tons of conversations about that this year. Uh, and I just want to make sure that folks remember February 14th, is the uh, last day to apply. And we'll dive deeper into bike lanes next. Speaking with Transportation Alternative Senior Organizer Juan Restrepo and Community Board 6 Chairperson Eric McClure about the role community boards play in planning if and how our streets get new or reimagined bike lanes.
One of the most exciting projects community boards frequently work on are bike lanes. And here to explain what that means in action are our guest, Juan Restrepo, of Transportation Alternatives, an organization working to transform our city streets into safe places for biking and walking. We also have with us Eric McClure, who's the chairperson of Community Board 6, which include the neighborhoods of Carroll Gardens, Cabo Hill, Columbia Waterfront, Gowanus, Park Slope, and Red Hook. Thank you guys so much for being here. Appreciate you both. Um, and let's just start right off the bat, uh, talk about uh, what is the state of biking in New York City today? Um, is it safe? Are a bunch of people riding? Uh, is it a tick up, tick down? Uh, just a general understanding of the state of biking in New York City, or, or better said, uh, the state of biking in Brooklyn. Because that's the most important borough, and we want to focus on that. Yeah. Well, I, if, if you look at the statistics from the Department of Transportation, the, the rate of bicycling in New York City has doubled in the last decade. They now are, are saying there are about 550,000 bike trips um, on a daily basis in New York City. Um, I'm sure a lot of those are in Brooklyn, yeah. and uh, that's up quite significantly from, from just a decade ago. So I, I think uh, biking is attracting more and more people mm -hmm. and uh, is presenting itself as a really viable and, and, in my opinion, superior way for people to get around the borough and the city. Awesome. That's but, true. Um, I think Eric is on point here. And when we think about it, like 550,000 trips per day, mm -hmm. when you look at a year, that's over 200 million trips per year. Wow. And that's more than before the pandemic. So we see biking as an increasing trend. Mm -hmm. And there are uh, quite a few elements that we've seen that are really contributing to that. We've seen the growth of e-mobility, where yeah. we see a lot of people who are now more able to access biking as a form mm -hmm. of recreation because uh, e-bike tools can make it easier for people to go up a hill. Mm -hmm. um, we're also seeing some like some some downward trends from that as well. We're seeing like a decrease in the amount of uh, women who are biking since 2018. And a lot of stats have shown that when we build out safe, protected bike networks, we can make constituencies like women feel safer on our roads. And it's obviously something we should be building towards. So um, we have something that's doing well, but we also have space to improve at the same time. So, so let's talk about that infrastructure. Bike lanes, for the folks out there that uh, don't know what the value of a bike lane is or feels that the bike lanes are encroaching on other uses that they think are more meaningful, why are bike lanes so important, especially in the context, the context of uh, women riders uh, dipping or going down um, and explaining why bike lanes might be able to help us uh, through that? Uh, I'll get us started. But um, I, I think it's important to keep in mind that um, a, a bike lane is more than just paint on the street. Mm -hmm. Oftentimes, it unlocks bicycling for uh, many, many people in our community. 60% um, of the cycling trips that are done in New York City are done by people of color. Mm -hmm. And oftentimes, biking is a more affordable way for people to go around. Yeah. You, you pay the initial fee or maybe even just get a bike from someone for free, mm -hmm. and you have access to all of New York City as long as your legs can keep you up. Yeah. So um, the only thing that holds people back from realizing that dream, and when we talk about you know, women or, or anyone who really wants to utilize this network, is how safe does it feel? And would you be willing to do it yourself? Would you allow your child to go on a bike lane? Would you right. allow your parents to go on a bike lane? Right. We really want a network of bike lanes that connect with each other, bring you to all the different boroughs, right. and that really right. works for anyone who's eight years old or 80 years old. Right, right. What do you think about bike lanes? <laughs> I, well, I, I think they're safe, protected cycling infrastructure is absolutely crucial to encourage mm -hmm. people to get on a bicycle. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we, we've seen this big growth in cycling and it, it really ha corresponds with a expansion of protected bike lanes and, mm -hmm. and the bike network in New York City over the past decade. Right. Mm -hmm. We have a long way to go though to get to a place where everyone is safe on a bicycle in New York City mm -hmm. and uh, you know something that community boards can help move along is, right. is that whole process of, of creating, designing, installing bike lanes. And, and because we're here in the room and we're kind of preaching to the choir here, what we're trying to do is really have folks in Brooklyn understand exactly how they can impact uh, 
change or meaningful change in their neighborhoods through the community board related to transportation. Um, and when we talk about bike lanes, you know, not everyone is as, as loving of them as we are. Uh, what, what are some of the compromises or I guess the challenges to the compromises that can be met um, when we build out just general infrastructure for mobility or moving in this city? Um, what do you think the ideal, the ideal, I guess, street looks like? For us, the ideal street as an organization is one that really takes into account the needs of everybody's um, use of the street. Mm -hmm. um, we have a program called 25 by 25 where we ask for 25% of street space to be reclaimed from car usage towards um, uh, human-centered use. And I think that can oftentimes be seen, you know, when we talk about being in an echo chamber as a bad thing. And when we try to explain it to a wider variety of people, we, we can talk about bike lanes and how we can create bike lanes, but we can also talk about how we can alleviate trash issues because we don't have enough containerized trash on our streets. Mm -hmm. We can talk about flooding issues that are um, happening closer to uh, Howard Beach yeah. and like some of the southern portions of Brooklyn uh, by creating bioswales and other uh, remediation, uh, remediation solutions. Um, there are just so many ways that we, we can look at our asphalt as an asset and bike lanes is one mm -hmm. of them, but there are so many other ways that we can be looking at our streets uh, right. to improve them. When we talk about the streets, can we do the best you can, I guess, uh, to explain to the general public why it is that we have to move away from the over-reliance on vehicles? Uh, there's this perception that we want to take cars away or that there's a war on cars, but it's uh, more explaining you know, what progressive transportation policy looks like and why it exists in the first place. Um, when I think about the prompt that you brought up about compromise and the role of community boards in that process, mm -hmm. I think a lot about something that actually happened in Queens. Um, community Board 11, which represents the Bayside, uh, it's one of the biggest transit deserts in the city, has no subway access, just buses and a little bit of Long Island Railroad support. Yeah. And that community board came together with members of their uh, board who were cyclists, who understood the issues, who were brought on because of that knowledge. Yeah. And they were able to, um, when the city asked them to compromise and create a bike network in their area, in, an area that's predominantly only cars, and make it just nothing protected, um, just you know, sometimes the arrows on yeah. the street or just uh, something that isn't protected by parked cars, they pushed back yeah. and they said, we don't want to compromise on yeah, safety. Right. We want to create a really safe bike network. And we can see that um, that sets a standard for the rest of um, our city when even a transit yeah. uh, desert understands that a safe bike network is really what's gonna get people to get around by bicycle right. and to opt out of their cars if they choose to. Right, and, and I always try to inform people of the fact that we only have a limited street grid uh, and people talk about parking. We've seen an increase in the ownership of vehicles and the parking is not a problem because of the bike lanes or because of city bike or even the restaurant, uh, outdoor dining restaurants. It's actually because we have so many cars that folks have to travel more. So uh, really great to, to hear from you guys and uh, just let people know what community boards are thinking and how we're moving through it. So I wanna just thank you guys for, for um, answering those questions in this segment. So we really appreciate it. And now, uh, we got time for a quick like lightning round if we can. Um, what do you expect from community boards next year? What, do you, what, what's your, what are you thinking for community boards next year? Well, I, I hope in our situation that um, there, there are some projects that definitely need um, further development in, in our okay. neighborhoods. Um, we, we had a, a really terrible incident last week on 9th Street and Park Slope mm -hmm. where a young mother was struck by right. a driver of a truck and killed. and. Uh, the, there is a protected bike lane on 9th Street, but it does not go all the way west on 9th Street. And she was riding her city bike in an area of the bike, the area of the street that was not protected. And uh, community boards can look at streets like that and really affect meaningful change on incidents like that. But I really want to thank you both for joining us today. And as a biker myself, I'm so appreciative to the people like you and the organizations and the community boards who are working together to build a city that allows residents to make transportation choices that protect our environment and keep our streets safe. Uh, and to all the viewers out there, if you want to have a greater say in the future of your streets, your community, and this borough all together, a reminder that now is the time to get involved. Apply on our website before February 14th, 2023. <music>
My name is Julio Pena III, and I have the great honor of serving the neighborhoods of Sunset Park, Windsor Terrace, and Greenwood as chairperson to Community Board 7. I got involved with CB7 when I was 18 years old, right after graduating high school through the Sunset Park High School Task Force. What encouraged me to join was the fact that for decades, our community had been owed a new high school, but every year the project was put off again. We had had enough. CB7's Education Committee organized a task force led by community leaders and Center for Family Life's co-executive director, Julie Stein Brockway. And together, we advocated for our community, the Department of Education, and the city to get our school built. I was on that task force, and one of my most memorable experiences was when we held a rally outside the courthouse welcoming New York City's school chancellor, Dennis Walcott, when he attended an education committee meeting to hear from us on why this community deserved its school. The rally was full of singing, chanting, and a beautiful community in unison. In 2006, we finally won our new school, and after three years, it opened its doors to our community. I saw through a deep community partnership how the work of a community board can have meaningful impacts. After that, I joined the Education Committee as a public member to continue the work we started. And in 2016, I was appointed to the board by then Council Member Carlos Menchaca. Later, in June 2022, I was elected chair. Community boards are as grassroots as it gets. It's your neighbors solving issues. We hold each other and our city accountable to the needs of our neighbors. The best part is that you can get involved in many different ways. Like me, you can start out just as an engaged neighbor going to public meetings. You can join a committee as a public member, or you can go all the way and apply to be a full community board member through the borough president's website. No matter what, you're never too early or too late to get involved in the future of your neighborhood. Brooklyn, I'm so glad you could all join me today on this tour through our borough's community boards. What makes Brooklyn special is the people who make it up. So please, get involved in any way you can. Apply to join your community board before February 14th. And of course, don't forget to spread love. It's the Brooklyn way.